Pastor Rick. Church family, it's so good to see you here as we're starting to fill up our Wednesday nights. Why don't you stand to your feet and let's worship together to the one who does alone give us hope in all things. <laughs>
when I think about that line, the body they may kill, God's truth abideth still. His kingdom is forever. You can't help but think about what's going on with our brothers and sisters across the globe right now um, who are facing that reality, right? Um, not knowing if tomorrow is going to come for them and their family. And here we are freely worshiping, church. I hope that we never, ever take this for granted. It really does blow my mind how people don't think this is important. <laughs> Right, That fellowship and church and community is not important. This is what the gates of hell cannot go against. It's not the building. It's the people of God that he has raised us up to be ambassadors for his namesake. So that when anything comes against us, we can say his kingdom will last forever. The body they may kill, but his truth abideth still. Man, what a great savior, right? So as we sing this last song together, man, just praise God <laughs> for what we have. So let's sing this together, church. Oh, sovereign God, oh, matchless King, the saints adore, the angels sing in full. sufferings, this passing tide, under your wings I will abide, and every enemy shall flee, you are my hope and victory. So praise the Oh, love.
Amen. Hello. There we go. You may be seated. My name's Josh Brown. For those of you who don't know that, um, Pastor Scott wanted me to relay to you that, Lord willing, he'll be back Sunday, and, uh, and he's looking forward to that. But, but I'm very excited to share the word with you um, tonight. Actually, tonight's my first time preaching since before grace and surgery, uh, back in April. And so I'm, I'm very excited to, uh, to be able to share God's word again. But I just wanted to use this time because it has been a while since I've addressed the church as a whole. Just a reminder of how thankful my family um, is for you. Um, you know, First John talks a lot about proving the love of Christ in not only your word but in deed. And you all have shown that to my wife and I as we've encountered many difficulties. Uh, and I just wanted to thank you and commend you for that. Um, and thank you for showing the love of Christ in many tangible ways. Um, Grayson is doing well. Um, he's doing pretty well overall. We're so thankful. For those of you who don't know, my son was born with a heart condition. He's had three open heart surgeries. Uh, and his most recent one was in April. And it did not go as expected. Uh, we were supposed to be there for one to two weeks. Quick, I mean, as quick as an open heart surgery can be. And... There were complications, many of which had to do with his lungs. His diaphragms were almost completely inoperable or not working well. And uh, lots of lung issues kept us in the hospital for six weeks. And you all loved us and prayed for us from the very beginning to the very end and have still prayed. And I have no doubt that God has used those to allow him to still be here today. And I just want to thank you for that. Um, and now he's doing, he's doing well. He has more energy than he ever has before, even before surgery. Um, he's weaned off of most of his medication. His diaphragms are still not, uh, you know, up to speed yet, but they're getting there. Um, I was really hoping to actually have him here to be able to hold up like Simba, you know, <laughs> before you. Um, but uh, we're taking a little bit of precaution there as he still recovers. But... He, uh, he doesn't know you all, but he loves you all. And I just wanted to relay that to you, how much we are thankful for you, loving, uh, loving us in that way. Uh, Troy, I asked Troy to show a couple pictures for you, just so you can see how he's doing. This is little Grayson and his best friend, little Wesley. Uh, and then uh, go ahead, Troy, to the next one. They love to swim, <laughs> and that's basically what he can do. And then uh, just a final picture to show you. He's come a long way. Um, thank you, Troy. Uh, in the hospital, just wondering, will he get off the mask? Will he get off a ventilator? These things. And to see him like that, this is why I can truly say I, I, I love you all in a way that you don't understand. Because you all have walked with us through this, and I, I thank you for that. So, this night is not about my family, though. And I, I hope Grayson's story is a testimony about God's kindness God's faithfulness, and that's what we're going to talk about tonight, because this is what we came to gather for, to speak about the glory of God. And we get to see that in Daniel 5. So turn in your Bibles to Daniel 5, and then we will pray, and then we will go on a journey together through this chapter that I trust will be very fruitful. Let's pray before we begin. Dearly Father, we, we need you. We need you now as we need you every moment of every day. We need you to keep our minds free from distraction. We need you to take another breath. We need you in every part of our lives. Lord, I pray that we would we would worship you as we go through this passage tonight. That we would leave this place in awe of who you are and with a greater understanding of who you are and a greater heart for worship of you and a greater sense 
of longing for you. Help us to do this well. Help us in this time, we pray. Amen. Daniel 5. If, if I asked you, what do you think of when you think of the book of Daniel? Some very common stories that you might think of are uh, Daniel in the lion's den. Or uh, the account of the fiery furnace. And Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego thrown into the furnace. God delivers them. Um, and it's an amazing feat. You might think of Daniel's interpretation of dreams. Or uh, maybe you think of the prophecies in Daniel. But Daniel 5 is not often talked about, not because it's not important, it's just uh, there's a lot of other stories that have greater prominence at times. But I trust that if you go on this journey with me through chapter 5, you will leave this place encouraged and in awe of God. And that's my goal. In fact, this chapter houses the origin for one phrase that is very commonly used even today. Have you ever heard the phrase, the writing on the wall? You ever heard that phrase before? Normally it's a phrase used in situations where a bad result is inevitable. It's coming. There's no stopping it. Something bad is on the way. And we find the origin of that phrase in this chapter. And it is exactly how you would expect it. But that's why I've entitled the message today... The writing is on the wall for the enemies of God. And so I think it will apply for this chapter, yes, but it will apply to us today. But before we do, we have to set the scene. Before we parachute into Daniel 5, we've got to get a good uh, idea of what's around Daniel 5. We've got to figure out what is going on because that's what's going to be most fruitful if we just jump into a chapter. And... It's important to know that there is a time gap between chapter 4 and chapter 5. We know this very simply because in chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar is mentioned. He's a king in Babylon. And then in chapter 5, we're introduced to a totally new king. So therefore, uh, there's a time gap. Now, we'll get into how much of a time gap in just a moment. But we're introduced to a king named Belshazzar in chapter 5, verse 1. Now, Belshazzar... So bear with me as we kind of get the background. It, this, will make, this will make sense and be helpful. Belshazzar actually, his, history tells us, was the son of a king. And he would resume the throne when his father was away, perhaps in times of war or in times of uh, where he would leave the kingdom. Well, he is the acting king of Babylon, and that's important. He's in charge here, and this story we're about to read marks the end of the Chaldean dynasty, rulers of Babylon. This chapter, we see the end of an era, the end of Babylon as it was known. And so, because we know the date that that occurred, we can date this chapter as occurring in 539 B.C., Now, we know Nebuchadnezzar died in about 561 B.C., so if you're tracking with me and do a little math, we know there's at least a little bit of a time gap of 22 years between chapter 4 and 5. Now, that that is all to say the dynasty that is about to be destroyed was no ordinary kingdom. Nebuchadnezzar, which you might have some familiarity with, was no ordinary king. This man was world-renowned. Babylon was the ruling nation of the known world. Nebuchadnezzar was a massive part of this dynasty. He was known for, of course, the destruction of Jerusalem and taking captive Daniel and his friends. He was known for, not only that, he was known for the destruction of Egypt And Jeremiah uniquely calls Nebuchadnezzar a servant of God in that. Not that he worshipped God, but that God intended to use Nebuchadnezzar to this end. He subdues the nations. He was known for his military prowess. He was known for his major feats of construction. 
Uh, you might have heard of the Hanging Gardens before, one of the, ancient wonder, the seven ancient wonders of the world at the time. He was credited for building that. In addition, the Great Walls of Babylon were world-renowned, considered a wonder of the world as well. People feared him everywhere he went. He conquered anyone before him. He was even worshipped by some, but he was eventually humbled. He was brought low in chapter 4. And we read that, of course, we're not going to now, but you might recall Nebuchadnezzar, after exalting himself above God, lost his mind. And God made him as one of the beasts in the field to roam and get on his knees until he acknowledged that God was indeed the ruler, not him. And he was restored, chapter 4 ends, and we transition into chapter 5. Now, it is important to know that we're about to read a chapter that the, this very night in this chapter, the dynasty is over. And because of that, we know that the backdrop of this whole story we're about to read is a backdrop of war. That's important. It's a backdrop of war. The context of where we find ourselves in Babylon is Babylon is under siege by a major power named Cyrus. The Persians and the Medes have combined forces. Babylon has been defeated at major strongholds and they find themselves in their last stronghold, the towering city of Babylon. These walls were impenetrable. Some historians note that these were hundreds of feet high. We don't know. There's some accounts that only say 75 feet. We're not exactly sure, but they were world-renowned, considered a wonder of the world. They were at least 32 feet thick, and some historians say up to 50 or 70 feet thick, these walls. Impenetrable fortress is what I want you to think of when you think of Babylon, the place that could not fall. And here, Belshazzar finds himself in chapter 5. So are you with me? Is the picture painted a little bit? Okay, here we go. Come with me on this journey through chapter 5. The first point, a foolish feast at death's door. Belshazzar, the king, here we go, first one. Belshazzar, the king, held a great feast for a thousand of his nobles, and he was drinking wine in the presence of a thousand We'll pause there for a moment. Do you suspect that wartime is an appropriate time for a feast? Doesn't that seem a little off? It seems totally off. And it's supposed to be. It was a foolish time for feasting. For many reasons, of course. Wartime, there's a completely different tone. There's a seriousness, there's a soberness in war where you are always on guard. It was not a time to celebrate. Feasts were for celebrating, were for victory. And here the Babylonians find themselves holed up in their massive fortress. And the king calls for a feast for all his nobles. It's foolish not only because it's inappropriate timing, but it's a foolish use of resources, right? If you're going to be holed up in a city for a long time under siege by the new powers of the world, you should try to preserve food. You should try to preserve wine, etc., etc. There is no regard for these things. Some scholars suspect that he might have held this feast as such a display of confidence that Babylon would never be conquered. Perhaps that's the case. Perhaps we don't know. The text doesn't say It's also an inappropriate feast because you should be vigilant, watchful in times of siege, not relaxing, drinking, partying. But as if that wasn't foolish enough, walk with me further and we will see his foolishness compounded in verse 2. When Belshazzar tasted the wine, he gave orders to bring the gold and silver vessels which Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken out of the temple which was in Jerusalem, so that the kings and his nobles, his wives and his concubines might drink from them. Then they brought the gold vessels that they had taken out of the temple, the house of God, which was in Jerusalem, and the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines, drank from them. 
Now, he is adding to the foolishness by bringing the articles of the temple of God to this feast and using them as part of their revelry. Not only that, in verse 4, read with me, they drank the wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone, the very vessels of the temple that were set aside for holy use to the one true God they now use to worship the gods of gold and silver and iron. What a disgrace. We see later in this chapter that this was not just because the king was out of cups. Babylon had plenty of things to put wine in. This was a display of exaltation over the one true God. This was Belshazzar saying, consider the enemies we have previously conquered. Let us drink from the articles of their temple. This was an insult to the one true God. And God who sees all looks upon this and the scene is about to shift drastically, which leads us to point two. From feasting to terror, God writes on the wall. Read verse five and six with me. Suddenly, the fingers of a man's hand emerged and began writing opposite the lampstand on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the back of the hand that did the writing. Then the king's face grew pale, and his thoughts alarmed him, and his hip joints went slack, and his knees began knocking together. Imagine this for a moment. You're with a thousand nobles. You're the king. You're with a thousand of your ruling nation. And you're partying. You're exalting yourself over the gods you have seemingly defeated in the past. And all of a sudden, a hand, mind you, there's no body attached to this hand. A hand appears. This is straight out of horror movie type stuff. A hand appears... And that, as if that wasn't scary enough, the hand is animate. It's moving. And as if that wasn't frightening enough, it's moving as if it's writing. And the king realizes it's not only writing, it's writing a message to him. This, it sends chills down my spine even picturing myself there. Because the king even knows this is not normal. His reaction says it. Look at it. His face grew pale. His thoughts, his thoughts are racing. His hip joints went slack. He's about to collapse. And his knees were knocking together. The king of Babylon, the ruler of the world. We see this and we keep going here. Let's see what happens next. The king called aloud to bring in the conjurers, the Chaldeans and the de diviners. The king spoke and said to the wise men of Babylon, any man who can read this inscription and explain its interpretation to me shall be clothed with purple and have a necklace of gold around his neck and have authority as third ruler in the kingdom. Do you get the urgency here? He has stopped sipping his wine. I almost imagine him with a goblet of wine watching this as a hand appears, stunned, the goblet drops, shatters. That's just what I picture. Because this frightened him to no end. In fact, he stops the party. He cries aloud, it says. He called aloud in verse 7, Any man, I'll give him third in the kingdom right now. In other words, he will spare no expense to get this interpreted because this is not normal. Now, some wonder if uh, he could see the message and others couldn't. We don't know. But we do know, verse 8 says, Then all the king's wise men came in, the best he had. But they could not read the inscription or make known its interpretation to the king. They had nothing for him. Despite his best offers, they had nothing to give him. 
And it's speculated maybe they couldn't see it. Maybe they could, maybe it was in a language they couldn't read. I don't think that was the case. Or maybe they could read it, but it didn't make sense. And therefore it needed interpretation. In whatever case, the king is out of luck. The best of his best have got nothing. He is confused, and we see this in verse 9. Then King Belshazzar was greatly alarmed. His face grew even paler. Whatever the pale of pale is, that's what he is. And his nobles were perplexed. All of them are looking on as he's experiencing this, and they're confused. And then we see the queen intervenes in verse 10. The queen entered the banquet hall because of the words of the king and his nobles. The queen spoke and said, O king, live forever. Do not let your thoughts alarm you or your face be pale. There is a man in your kingdom in whom is a spirit of the holy gods. And in the days of your father, illumination, insight, and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father the king, appointed him chief of the magicians, conjurers, Chaldeans, and diviners. This was because an extraordinary spirit, knowledge and insight, interpretation of dreams, explanation of enigmas, and solving of difficult problems were found in this Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar. Let Daniel now be summoned, and he will declare the interpretation. Notice the queen suggests something very wise. Bring in Daniel. He has a history of interpreting things that need interpretation. But notice the insults along the way. She ascribes that wisdom to other gods. It's a spirit of wisdom, an extraordinary spirit that's in him. It can't be the one true God. So we move on to point three. Sin is confronted before the interpretation is given. And we see this. Let's read verse 13 through 17. Then Daniel was brought in before the king, and the king spoke and said to Daniel, Are you that Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, whom my father, the king, brought from Judah? Now I have heard about you, that a spirit of the gods is in you, and that illumination, insight, and extraordinary wisdom has been found in you. Just now the wise men and the conjurers were brought in before me, that they might read this inscription and make its interpretation known to me. But they could not declare the interpretation of the message. But I personally have heard about you, that you are able to give interpretations and solve difficult problems. Now if you are able to read the inscription and make its interpretation known to me, you will be clothed with purple and wear a necklace of gold around your neck, and you will have authority as the third ruler in the kingdom. I love this response by Daniel. Then Daniel answered and said before the king, keep your gifts for yourself, or give your rewards to someone else who actually cares about it, However, I will read the inscription to the king and make the interpretation known to him. So the king's buttering him up. The king's saying, I've heard about you. He just heard about him like five seconds ago, you know, or 30 minutes, whatever the time that has elapsed. He just heard about him, even though he should have remembered this. He doesn't. He calls him, he offers him the third place in the kingdom behind him and the queen. What a wonderful thing. And Daniel says... I've got no interest in your rewards. And the reason why I think he says that is because he has no interest in a kingdom that comes to an end. And I think we're going to see that a little bit later as well. He's got no interest in these things. He serves the Most High God. So let's read what happens next. I can almost imagine, briefly before we read 18... As Daniel enters the room and is about to give his interpretation, he's about to confront him with sin. I read these next words in verse 18 like this. Oh, king. A sigh. He should have known better. Oh, king. And he's about to explain. The most high God granted sovereignty, grandeur, glory, and majesty to Nebuchadnezzar, your father. Because of the grandeur which he bestowed on him... All the peoples, nations, and men of every language feared and trembled before him. Whomever he wished, he killed. And whomever he wished, he spared alive. And whomever he wished, he elevated. And whomever he wished, he humbled. But whenever his heart was lifted up and his spirit became so proud that he behaved arrogantly, he was deposed from his royal throne and his glory was taken away from him. You remember we mentioned that in chapter 4. That's what it's referring to. 
verse 21. He was also driven away from mankind and his heart was made like that of beasts and his dwelling place was with the wild donkeys. He was given grass to eat like cattle and his body was drenched with the dew of heaven until he recognized that the most high God is ruler over the realm of mankind and that he sets over it whomever he wishes. Yet you... His son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, even though you knew all this. But you have exalted yourself against the Lord of heaven, and they have brought the vessels of his house before you, and you and your nobles, your wives, and your concubines have been drinking wine from them, and you have praised the gods of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which do not see, hear, or understand, but the God in whose hand are your life breath. And all your ways you have not glorified. Wow. This is far more frightening than a hand floating. And it gets worse. But we see in verse 18 that Daniel is saying something very interesting. Something we need to remember. And he needed to be reminded of as well. Look in verse 18. O king, the most high God granted Everything Nebuchadnezzar accumulated to him. All of the glory of your dynasty, all of the glory of your kingdom, it was given by God. God is sovereign. This is what we mean. God gives all power to anyone who has it. Verse 19, we see that God elevated Nebuchadnezzar to the position of being able to decide who lives, who dies, who is promoted in the kingdom, who is d- uh, decreasing in the kingdom. In other words, God elevated, uh, elevated him to a position of a God almost. He could decide what's right and wrong, not that he wouldn't be judged, but he gave Nebuchadnezzar great power. But verse 20 and 21 tell us This all went to Nebuchadnezzar's head. He began to think his power came from himself, not from the Most High God. And he was quickly reminded that when he became a beast, like a beast, God humbled him greatly until he acknowledged that God is ruler above the rulers of the world. That's when Nebuchadnezzar had his mind restored. And this is what Daniel is saying here to Belshazzar. You should have known. Did you not see this happen? Did you not hear this in your history? When you oppose my God, things don't end well. And Belshazzar had not learned. He continued in his sin. And verse 23 records his great sin of using these vessels inappropriately, exalting the gods that they served. And finally, as if it wasn't painful news enough, Daniel adds in there in verse 23. I love how he adds this in there. In the, back, uh, in the back half of verse 23, it says, And you have praised the gods of silver and gold and bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which, by the way, have no eyes. They don't see. They don't hear you. They don't understand you because they're not God. Daniel is saying, you're worshiping the wrong things. Belshazzar had rejected God, the one who it says was in his very life breath. That gives me chills to think our very life breath is in the hands of God Almighty. He decides when we live. He decides when we die. Point four, we're finally getting to the interpretation. God's servant delivers the ominous message sent by the hand. Verse 24 and 25. Then the hand was sent from him and this inscription was written out. Now this is the inscription that was written out. Four words. Mene, mene, tekel, upharsin. Four words. Interpretation would definitely be required even if 
the king knew what these words meant. Mene means numbered. Tekul means weighed. Ufarsin or Ufarsin means divided. In other words, the message read numbered, numbered, weighed, divided. You can see how that would need interpretation, right? What does that mean? Daniel now says what it means in verse 26. This is the interpretation of the message. God has numbered your kingdom and put an end to it. And I'm going to read it again because it's written out twice. God has numbered your kingdom and put an end to it. Tekel, you have been weighed on the scales and found deficient. Perez, which, by the way, if you start panicking because it's a different word, Perez has its origin or is the singular form of Eupharsin. Okay? So it's derived from the same word. It's the singular form. We can explain that later, but it's not important now. Your kingdom has been divided and given over to the Medes and Persians. I just, I, I'm trying to imagine the king's face. Not only did he just see a floating hand writing something to him. Not only is he under siege by the Persians and the Medes. Not only did he just get called out for all of his wickedness before the Most High God. But now the writing is on the wall and his fate is sealed. God has numbered your kingdom and put an end to it. You've been weighed on the scales and found deficient, and your kingdom has been divided and given over to the Medes and the Persians. Now, this is incredible as well, because you know what's interesting? This is new revelation to Belshazzar. He didn't know this before. But you know who did know this would happen? The Jews, if they were listening to Isaiah. This is cool. Isaiah 13, 17 through 20. This is before the captivity. Behold, this is speaking to Babylon. Behold, I am going to stir up the Medes against them who will not value silver or take pleasure in gold and their bows will mow down the young men. They will not even have compassion on the fruit of the womb nor will their eye pity children. And Babylon, the beauty of kingdoms, the glory of the Chaldeans' pride will be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. It will never be inhabited or lived in from generation to generation nor will the Arab pitch his tent there nor will shepherds allow their flocks to lie down there. It's this fulfillment of prophecy. Now back to the story though. Picture the king. If there's a pail of pail of pail, I would imagine that's probably what the king looks like. So what did he do after hearing this message? Surely he would fall down before Daniel and say, I've messed up. I have, I have done wrong. Call upon your God. May he please divert this disaster from me. What does it say that he does? Verse 29, Then Belshazzar gave orders, and they clothed Daniel with purple and put a necklace of gold around his neck, and he issued a proclamation concerning him that he now had authority as the third ruler in the kingdom. That seems like a strange response to me. In fact, by issuing that proclamation, it almost sounds like he doesn't believe it's true. Or he doesn't expect when, it to, when it's true. He's going forward with his word, as he should. But this proclamation of making Daniel the third in command, which Daniel didn't even want, will be the last proclamation he ever makes. Point five. The message fulfilled with a sudden defeat. Verse 30 through 31. That same night, Belshazzar... The Chaldean king was slain. Verse 31, so Darius the Mede received the kingdom at about the age of 62. There's a lot of details that are in between those two verses. He wasn't just slain by one of his own people that we know of, but the city was taken. And history tells us, so we can fill the gap in a little bit between these verses... History 
historians, specifically Herodotus, even one of the um, one of the most renowned historians of the time, cites that Babylon was overtaken by Cyrus and his army in the middle of the night during a feast, during a festival. And some wonder, well, how did, how did they get in? In fact, historians say this defeat was not a long defeat. Once they were in, it was over. The city was taken. The king was slain. And history tells us this. If you know Babylon's geography, the Euphrates River runs through it. And Babylon was known they built, uh, you know, big, huge bridges over that, etc. It was wonderful. It was a spectacle to behold, Babylon. And the story goes, at least according to multiple historians, the way that they got in was by, and this didn't happen overnight, this didn't happen in one day, but they began to, dug, to dig channels for, far away from the city to divert the Euphrates River, at least uh, lowering the water level. And it got to the point, historians say, to about mid-level up the man's thigh, just enough for the army to walk right into the city, to get right into the city where the Euphrates was once it reached a certain level. Again, this took time. This is not like in a day's span. But this is how the story goes. And he was slain this very night. So you can imagine behind the scenes, meanwhile, the feast, here comes the Persians through the very river that they boasted of. Here comes the enemy sneaking in, taking Babylon in one night. That's unheard of. The message was fulfilled. And there's suspicion of betrayal inside of Babylon as well to help this process move along. But it should, it should cause us to at least consider what was going on in Belshazzar's mind. From feast to message to death in a span of maybe hours. This is all fulfillment of prophecy as well. Jeremiah 51, we don't have full time to read it all, but listen to this, just a couple verses here. Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, has devoured me. He has crushed me. This is uh, Jeremiah speaking to the Jews of the vengeance he would take against Nebuchadnezzar for the sins of destroying his people. He says this, therefore this is what the Lord says, Behold, I'm going to plead your case and take vengeance for you, Jerusalem, and I will dry up her sea and make her fountain dry. Babylon will become a heap of ruins, a haunt of jackals, an object of horror and hissing without inhabitants. They will roar together like lion, young lions. They will growl like lion's cubs. Listen to this. Doesn't this sound like this story? When they become heated up, I will serve them their banquet and make them drunk so that they may rejoice in triumph and may sleep a perpetual sleep and not wake up. Though Babylon ascends to the heavens and though she fortifies her lofty stronghold, destroyer, destroyers will come from me to her, declares the Lord. And I will make Listen to this. I will make her leaders and her wise men drunk, her governors, her officials and her warriors, so that they will sleep a perpetual sleep and not wake up, declares the king whose name is the Lord of armies. These are direct, at least, fulfillments of prophecy in some way here. Babylon has fallen in the span of one chapter. Again, this didn't all happen in just one night. God kept his promise. The message on the wall came true right away. So what can we learn from the story, you might ask? Surely we can go away and say, yes, God is sovereign over kings and nations. We should go away with our faith encouraged that prophecy is fulfilled, that God's promises come true. Absolutely. We can even see that those who choose to exalt themselves against God will be humbled and brought low. We can even uh, rejoice in the fact that the very next year, history and the, and the scriptures tell us, Cyrus, who defeated Babylon, actually allows the Jews to return. 
the very next year. This is all very interesting, but I want to take it a step further as we close our time, and I want us to look at some parallels between what's in this story and for us today. The enemies of God today repeat the folly of Babylon. And I don't think it's any secret why Babylon is once again personified in Revelation. But that's a whole other sermon. Actually, a whole other series of sermons. Not going there now. But consider this. Belshazzar held a, fe- a great feast and celebrated on death's door. He celebrated as certain doom approached when he should have been on guard. He should have regarded his own life. But he chose the short-term pleasure and exaltation of self instead of considering the long-term perspective. Consider how that is like the world today. The world around us, meaning the enemies of God. Anyone who serves another God other than Jesus Christ is an enemy of God. The world, the enemies of God have an inevitable destruction awaiting them. And they would rather engage in revelry as they're marching towards death's door. They are partaking in the pleasures of this life for a moment when right outside the gates, eternity awaits. Consider Belshazzar and Babylon, how they exalted themselves above God by making themselves out to be God. They gloried in their own accomplishments and did not give glory to the one true God. Is that not the world today? We see the world lifting themselves high above God Almighty. They either reject him and deny his power, claim he doesn't exist. They glory in their own accomplishments, wealth, wisdom, power, pleasure, etc. But God is not mocked. Consider this in the story. Belshazzar foolishly trusted in impenetrable walls of Babylon. Babylon could not fall. You understand? There was no siege weapon to break down those walls. It didn't exist. Babylon and those in Babylon and Belshazzar foolishly trusted those walls. And the world likewise believes they are safe from the wrath of God. Maybe they believe they're safe because they deny his existence completely. And they think that will make them safe. Or they think, if I bring my good deeds, as long as I'm more good than bad, then I can subdue the wrath of God. In either way, both of those are seemingly impenetrable walls that will absolutely be overthrown. Consider the writing on the wall that foretold certain judgment for Babylon. Friends, just as God wrote on the wall, he has written in Scripture that the enemies of God will be destroyed. We don't need a floating hand to tell us this. It is in his word. And destruction awaits those who reject him, just like destruction awaited Belshazzar. Consider this. Daniel saw the rewards promised by the king as worthless because he knew that kingdom was coming to an end. What good is it to be third in command in a kingdom that is going to be destroyed? Right? I'm third command of rubble is basically, it means nothing. Likewise, we should have that mindset. What good are the rewards of this world? It's all fading away. Why do we want it? We see in this story that God raises up kingdoms and brings them to destruction. And we must remember that today, that every nation and kingdom across the earth today has been granted their power by the one who gives power. Do you believe that? And perhaps we'll go a step further. Daniel shows in this Story that any nation or king or people that exalt themselves over God will be destroyed. Vengeance is coming. It is certain and sure. And Christian, we must rest in this truth as well as anyone. Any Christian must rest in this truth knowing this, that the enemies of God in America today, 
the enemies of God in Afghanistan today will be destroyed. That doesn't mean it will go the way we want it on this earth, but you can bet that no deed goes unseen by God. Vengeance is his. He will destroy. So if you are worried about justice, nothing gets by God. They will reap their reward. And it will not be pretty just as it was with Belshazzar. They will be annihilated. They roam the earth acting like they are powerful now. But when they stand before God, they will give an account for every evil deed. Everything that is going on right now in Afghanistan, everything that is being done to the Christians by the wicked people over there, they will give an account. And I can rest in that. God doesn't let anyone off the hook. And you know what? If they don't take the punishment, if, if somebody's not going to take the punishment, you know who does in forgiveness is Jesus Christ. One of two people is going to bear the weight of sins. It's either the individual who is the sinner or it's Jesus Christ. Consider Belshazzar was weighed on the scale of God and he was found lacking. kind of a little play on words to understand, to say, hey, Belshazzar, you didn't make weight. God has a requirement. You didn't meet it. And just like Belshazzar's ways, so every one of us will be weighed. And we will see if we make it. And just before you start panicking and start thinking, okay, what good deeds do I need to add to my weight? If you're in Christ, you add nothing. You made weight. If you're in Christ. But if you are not, you are found deficient like Belshazzar and Babylon. Consider Belshazzar had no idea that night would be his last night on earth. Just as we have no idea when our last night will be. Maybe we don't have the Persians and Medes at our walls. But we do not know when the one who holds our life breath will take that away. This is why it is an urgent matter to be right with the Lord, because tomorrow is not guaranteed. And finally, it's the last thing I wanted to point out. It's not a parallel, but rather a stark difference between this account and our experience today. Belshazzar and Babylon received the writing on the wall, and there was no way to alter that judgment. Babylon's fate was sealed. It's done. Perhaps even while the hand was writing or while Daniel was giving interpretation, perhaps the Persians are already in the city. It's over. It's done. But there is a unique difference, and it is this, that if you draw breath today, it is not too late. You have the opportunity to not be an enemy of God. And not just that, you have an opportunity to be a friend of God. And not just that, you have an opportunity to be a son of God or daughter of God. How? By repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. This is the only way. This is the only way to escape impending judgment and rightful judgment on wickedness. Every breath God gives us is an undeserved opportunity to run to Christ It's not too late as long as you draw breath. Run to Jesus. He is worthy. He died so that your sins would be forgiven. And believer, you make weight. When you are weighed, God doesn't weigh your works versus his requirements. He puts Christ's righteousness on the scale and says, perfect, fulfilled, come into paradise Worship him if that is you. Run to him if that is not you. Experience his sweet protection. And this is why I've entitled the message this. The writing is on the wall for the enemies of God. Judgment is coming. Whose side are you on? And if you're on the side of Jesus, then you have no need to fear 
And I would go a little bit further and say, you have something to look forward to because evil will be destroyed. So, Daniel 5, lots of things to learn. I hope you enjoyed the journey. Let's pray. Dearly Father, thank you for these reminders in your word. A reminder that judgment is coming for sin. And it would be coming for our heads as well, if not for your intervention. Without Jesus Christ, we are hopeless. The writing would be on the wall for us. But it is not because you intervened, you saved us. Help us not to desire the things of a kingdom that is fading away. Help us to see past that. Help us to see past the lies of these temporary pleasures. And let us seek to serve you who will usher us into an eternal kingdom that will have no end. There will be no surprise attacks. There will be no wicked ruler. It will be perfect peace forever serving Jesus. We thank you for this reminder. Pray that you would remove any error that I have spoken. Help it to be quickly forgotten. But may the truth be remembered. Help us to worship you as we leave this place. It's in your name we pray. Amen.